Okay, we're starting a study of the book of 1 Corinthians this morning, and we'll, uh, we'll be in this book for the next several weeks. Um, we're going to have about, uh, about 15 classes total uh, with uh, a, few, uh, a few different other things happening in the midst of the next uh, 20 weeks. And so 15 weeks to cover a book that's got 16 chapters. Uh, you do the math, we're going to be moving quite a bit in some of this. Of course, you know me, uh, I'd rather have about 15 years to cover the book of 1 Corinthians, and then we might be close to being able to cover it the way I'd like to. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best that we can in, uh, in trying to get into as much of the book as we can and uh, just really glean what we can. But this morning, we'll, we will get into chapter 1. I might be a little ambitious thinking we'll get down to verse 17. Uh, but I do want to do just some introductory material, which anytime you come into a book of the Bible... You know, before you even start with verse 1, what are we even talking about? Uh, you know, when, when you get to the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, it's helpful to have a little bit of background information, a little background knowledge uh, about what's happening, uh, because I think it helps you to put it into perspective on, uh, on the things that Paul is dealing with as he's writing uh, this particular letter. And so I want to spend a little time just talking uh, about the city of Corinth. Um, and I don't know how much you know about the city of Corinth, but I think if we can know a little bit about the city uh, and what was going on uh, at, this at this particular time, maybe it gives us some insight into the church. Uh, do, you, do you think that a, you think a congregation takes on the flavor, takes on some of the, um, the qualities of a community in which they, they exist? Uh, I, you, know, would, was, you know, Dan McLeod's been over in the Pacific Congregations in the Pacific, while they worship the same and they teach the same, they're a little bit different over there uh, than, they, than they are here. Uh, you're not going to find somebody standing at the front with, wearing a suit uh, teaching in the Pacific. Uh, and so there, there's, there's just some, some, a few things that would be different. And so obviously I think if we can understand a little bit about Corinth, maybe that'll help us. Here's a city that was, it was destroyed by Rome. It was, it was a very prominent city, but it was destroyed by Rome at about 146 uh, B.C. But about 100 years later, Julius Caesar comes along and rebuilds this city uh, and rebuilds it to become a Roman colony, uh, which gave it certain rights and privileges inside the Roman Empire. Uh, if you were a Roman colony, it, it, it gave you certain uh, abilities that other, uh, other, other cities did not necessarily have. Uh, and it, uh, it was established as the capital of Achaia. Well, what in the world is Achaia? When you hear Achaia, does that mean anything to you? Uh, we, we would call it Greece uh, today. Uh, that's, that's ba but basically, and it's not, the borders were not the, the exact same as what we would consider Greece today. Uh, but basically, when you think about Greece, or if you read the word Achaia in your Bible, just think, okay, that's... That's similar to what we see as, as Greece uh, today. But if, if you've got a map in the back of your Bible, I would encourage you to always pinpoint where are certain places and cities uh, in the Bible. You know, when, when, if I say Stuart, Florida, you've got an idea of where that is. You know, if I say Atlanta, Georgia, you, you know, you, your brain goes to, you know, if I say Los Angeles, California, you're, you're, you ge geographically, you know where that is. But if we say Corinth, now, if we say Corinth, Mississippi, I know where that is, okay? But we're not talking about Corinth, Mississippi. So if you say Corinth, well, where is that? Um, and if you go to a map in the back of your Bible, you're going to see it's, it's a rather strategic location. If, if, you, if you've got a map of Greece, and basically that's what this, I know you can't see this smaller map down here of Greece, but that's what this is. And this little gulf here, this gulf of, of uh, Corinth, I, I believe is what it's called, almost cuts Greece in half, almost cuts Achaia in half. Uh, and so right here on this little isthmus, uh, there is the city of Corinth on the western side. There's the city of Sincrea over on the eastern side. But it's just a four-mile stretch of land. So if you've got a ma map in your back of your Bible, and, and it, may by, it may not, be, it may not uh, center a whole lot on Greece so that you can see that, but just note where is Corinth in the Bible? So it's a strategic location. What makes it that? Well, it's a strategic location north and south because all travel that's going to go down here to southern Greece, down here to southern Achaia, every bit of it has to go through Corinth. 
Is that going to help Corinth uh, in, in, a, in a matter of trade, in a matter of commerce, uh, in a matter of wealth? Is that, everything's got to run through Corinth to get down to the southern part. Now, you may not think this, but travel going east and west on the Mediterranean Sea, you would think, well, it would just go down here. That would be the easiest thing to do. Travel on the, on the, uh, on the water often went right across here. And you think, how can it go across there? There's not a, uh, there's not a gulf there. Often what they would do, this, this little cape down here, uh, this, I can't remember the name of this cape. Uh, uh, it's almost there, I've forgotten what it is. But this little cape below uh, Greece was a very dangerous place, uh, especially back then, uh, was a very dangerous location uh, for, for ships to travel. And so often what they would do uh, is they would come down, they would come over here to Corinth uh, and come to this little isthmus. And if the ship was small enough, they would, they, they had a rail system with some rollers and they would actually drag their ship across this, how would you like to do that? Well, instead of going uh, through that dangerous cape down south, they would just drag their ship four miles across this isthmus. Well, guess where they're going through? They're going through Corinth. So it's not just north and south, it's a major city uh, and a lot of travel, but east and west, uh, you've got a lot going on there. And sometimes if the ship was too big to drag, acro drag across, they would just unload their cargo, drag their cargo across, put it in a different ship and keep going. Um, and so, Travel, the, the point is, travel went through Corinth. There, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of um, different kinds of people coming in and out of Corinth. Uh, what's the business? Well, it's all sorts of business. Obviously, it's a major trade uh, city, but it, it's a manufacturing city. Uh, there was a mining, uh, there was some mining that was going on there. It was a major banking center, center there uh, in, uh, in that area. And so, this is a very uh, wealthy city. It's a very well-to-do place. The population, as we've mentioned, was rather transient. Uh, you've got people from all over, uh, sort of like South Florida, right? I mean, you've got people from all over uh, in Corinth, uh, which can be a good thing, but can be a difficult thing. Uh, but you've got, uh, because it's a Roman colony, you've got Roman soldiers who are stationed there. Uh, as a Roman colony... Uh, it's going to have Greek and Roman citizens, but it had a pretty large Jewish population there uh, as well. Because of the, the nature of the city, you've got merchants uh, who are coming in and out of there. You've got a lot of slaves because of, the, uh, because of the wealth of the city. You've got a lot of slaves who make up this city. So literally, there's all sorts of people who are there. It is, it's a population of I've seen estimates anywhere from 100 to 500,000 at the time of Paul, so that's a pretty broad range. But there's a lot of people. It's not just a small community uh, that is there. So that's a little, just kind of some background on what was this city like, but really what impacts a lot of what we see as we read this book is the spiritual condition of the city. When you've got all of these sailors coming to town, I'm sure they're bringing all of their uh, great Bible knowledge with them, right? You've got all these sailors coming to town. Uh, they're they're going to bring their, their great moral, uh, their, their high moral standard with them, right? Well, not exactly. Um, you know, the, the reputation that sailors have today uh, is not much different than the reputation that the sailors had uh, back then. And so here was a city who was known for its perverted idolatry. Um, the temple that just these, these columns that are here that still exist in the city of Corinth were from the temple of Apollo, um, but uh, the temple of Aphrodite was, is really what, uh, when you read a lot of history books, especially as they relate to Bible matters, uh, the temple of Aphrodite is the temple that's uh, perhaps well, more well known to us in our study than the temple of Apollo because the temple of Aphrodite, Aphrodite, uh, was the goddess of love. Well, that sounds nice, right? I mean, this, this is great. She, she's, uh, uh, she's just going to help, you know, this goddess, this, this mythical goddess is going to help everybody to love each other. Well, at this temple of Aphrodite, and you, you've heard about this before, there were, uh, they didn't have necessarily priests who served at the temple of Aphrodite, uh, but instead they, they were a little more modern. They had priestesses who served at the temple of Aphrodite. 
Um, but these priestesses would better be described with another PR word. Uh, prostitutes is what they were. And I have seen estimates of there being as many as a thousand of these priestesses, prostitutes, who worked at the temple. They're, they're there working. Well, what are they doing at the temple? Well, they're serving the men who are coming to worship the goddess Aphrodite. What does that tell you about this, this land, this city, uh, where Paul is going to preach the gospel? Uh, this, this, is, this is a prominent... Now, not just Apollo and Aphrodite. They, they were, there were multiple other gods that were worshipped in this area, and so it was known for its perverted idolatry. It was known for its shameful immorality, especially because of the, the temple of Aphrodite. You have all of these people bringing all of their, their various vices uh, into the land. And so in the first century, uh, they would sometimes use the name Corinthian. Um, you know, I'm a Floridian. Some of you are Floridians, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But sometimes they would use the name Corinthian, not to say, well, oh, that's where they're from, but to identify this is what kind of person they are. Uh, if they talked, if they use that in a verb form, in a verb form, talking about oh they're they're Corinthianizing this area. Well, that wasn't that wasn't a a positive uh, thing to say because it was it was being used in a derogatory way. Uh, because if you were identified as a Corinthian, it didn't mean oh that's where you're from. It meant that you were a drunken, immoral individual. Well, that sounds nice, right? Uh, and so. Paul comes to this town where there's a bunch of drunken, immoral individuals. Look in chapter 6. Look in, you know this verse, but allow just some of this background stuff on talking about Corinth. Look in chapter 6 and verse 9. Paul says to this church, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators... Were there any of those in Corinth? Nor idolaters? <laughs> Were there any of those? Nor adulterers? Nor homosexuals? Nor sodomites? Were there? Yes, there were those. Nor thieves? Nor covetous? Nor drunkards? Were there any of those? Nor revilers? Nor extortioners? Will inherit the kingdom of God? Well, Paul, you just listed everybody in Corinth. He's, he's not just choosing random words here. You've just talked about everybody in Corinth, but what does he say in verse 11? And such were some of you. A lot of emphasis in that statement. Such were some of you. Yeah, we're from Corinth. Being a drunkard, being immoral, being a fornicator, being a homosexual, being an idolater. Yes, that's what, that's the life that we had. Well, why does he use the past tense were? They're not that anymore. What changed? They, they learned about Jesus Christ. You look at the immorality that's in America today, and we throw up our hands and we say, there's no hope. We're done. There, there, there's just no way that this spiraling out of, out of control direction in, into this, this vile immorality, there's nothing that can be done. If you were living in Corinth back then, could you have thought maybe the same thing? No hope for us. Well, what happened? The gospel came to town. The gospel changed their lives. Uh, what do we need to be doing today? We don't need to wait for the Apostle Paul to come to town. Guess what you are? You are the Apostle Paul in town. You've got it better than the Apostle Paul does. The Apostle Paul did not have the completed New Testament that you have today. You've got the complete package to share with people who need the gospel. Is there, is, is there something that West Palm Beach or, or, or Riviera Beach or Palm Beach Gardens or Boynton Beach or Wellington or Royal Palm Beach or Stewart or Vero Beach or wherever anybody is from, is, is there something that people need today? Yeah, and we've got it. And what changed them is what can change people today. And so let's, let's talk about the church. That's just a little bit about the city. Let's talk a little bit about the church. Turn your Bible to Acts, uh, uh, well, Acts 18. Go to Acts 18. And we'll, we'll kind of go through this 
hopefully quick enough to, to save some time at the end, but uh, slow enough to grasp this. Uh, context. Context here in Acts 18. Um, in Acts 16, Paul, uh, Paul gets to Tro the, the city of Troas, and he receives what we call the Macedonian call, right? He's in Troas. He, was, he sees a vision from a man of Macedonia. What's the man of Macedonia saying? Come over here and help us. So Paul gets on a ship, and he makes his way over to Macedonia, preaches the gospel in, in uh, the Roman colony there of Philippi, the prominent city, uh, makes his way down to Thessalonica. He's run out of Thessalonica in chapter 17, uh, and he's run out of Thess Thessalonica in chapter 17 earlier than he wants to be, uh, but uh, the disciples made him leave because of the danger that he was in. And so when he leaves Thessalonica, where does Paul end up at the end of chapter 17? The end of chapter, don't say Corinth because that's 18. Where does he end up at the end of chapter 17 after he leaves Thessalonica? He's in another city of Greece. Uh, he's in the city of Athens. And so he preaches in the city of Athens and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come to him and to tell him, how are things going in Thessalonica? I had to leave before I wanted to. How are things going in Thessalonica? Well, uh, Silas and Timothy don't get to Paul while he's in Athens. And so Paul leaves Athens. Look in chapter 18, verse 1. He leaves Athens and he comes to what city in verse 1? Are you with me? You all can speak up. He comes to the city of Corinth. Good. All right. So he comes to Corinth. And when he's in Corinth, he's going to be waiting there again for Silas and Timothy uh, to come and meet him. He found Aquila and Priscilla uh, there in, uh, in Corinth. Um, what do we know about Aquila and Priscilla? Say again. Somebody said something. I just didn't hear it. Y'all got to speak up. I'm getting old. Okay, so they, they, they were from Rome, but you see here that they're run out of Rome uh, because, because of the persecution that was uh, going on there. They're coming to Corinth. What did they do for a living? They were tent makers. What did Paul do for a living? Wonder how they met. Well, they, they met down at, uh, they met down at the, uh, the trade store where they were buying all of their supplies to go and, oh, you're, you're a New Testament Christian too. Great, all right, so... Finally, the point, look at verse 5. Silas and Timothy finally get to him. Where did they come from? Macedonia. Where's that? That's where he had left them when he had to leave Thessalonica. They come, they report to him about how things are going back in Thessalonica. And so it's here, while Paul is in Corinth, that Paul writes what we have as First and Second Thessalonians. His first epistles uh, is what he's writing while he is here in Corinth. But while he's in Corinth, he's not just writing back to a church in Thessalonica. He's working with this, uh, working in this area. Verse 11, how long is he working with the church there in Corinth? A year and six months. So he's there for 18 months. The, the only other place that he works longer than this is when he gets over to Ephesus uh, in chapter 19. So Paul didn't spend a lot of time in certain places because he's trying to get to more places, but he spends a year. Why would you spend a year and a half in Corinth? You think there's a little bit of work to do? There's a, there's a lot of work to do here. And so he spends a lot of time in this place teaching people uh, the gospel. And I've, I've got more up here. And I, let me just put all of this here. Um, and so while he is here, uh, he is uh, um, reasoning. Verse 4, he's reasoning with individuals uh, there in the synagogue. That was his, that was his, uh, his pattern. That was what he... That was his custom, is what we saw at the beginning of chapter 17, is going to the synagogue. So that indicates to you they've got a good a Jewish-sized population that is there. He's persuading both Jews and Greeks. So becoming a part of the church there was both Jews and Gentiles there in the city of, in the city of Corinth. But uh, look down at verse 12, um, where you learn about Galileo, who was the proconsul there in, uh, in Achaia. And the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul, verse 12, brought him to the judgment seat, and they said, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Contrary to what law? Um, they're, they're all upset about this God, this Jesus, that Paul is preaching about. The Jews didn't want, some of the Jews didn't want to hear about this Jesus. 
And so, verse 14, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Paul was about ready to defend himself, and the providence of God took over. I, the Bible doesn't say that, but I believe that this is the providence of God at work. Back up, look at verse 10 for real quick. Uh, sorry, verse 9. Lord spoke to Paul in the night vision. This is when he's in Corinth. Do not be afraid, but, but speak and do not be silent. If you were in Corinth, would you be a little afraid? Uh, what does he say in verse 10? For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. Well, they just arrested him down here, but they won't attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. I have many people in this city? Does that necessarily mean that God is saying, I have many Christians in this city? Do you think Paul knew all of the Christians in Corinth? Uh, yeah, he knew them all because there weren't any before he got there. You think he knew? So when Paul says, when God says, I have many people in this city, do you think, Paul, do you think God was limiting himself to just talking about Christians or perhaps was he talking about people that he could use for his cause, for his purpose? Uh, remember that when God talked about the Roman armies, he said, those are my armies. What are you talking about? Those, those, those aren't your, well, he's going to use the Roman armies. So anyway, I point that out. Back down, what verse are we in? Verse 14. Paul's about ready to open his mouth. Galileo said to the Jews, the Jews have brought him before Galileo for the, to get judgment, to get the, the proconsul to tell Paul, stop preaching. And what does the proconsul say? Um, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, if this man had broken the law, oh Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. Yeah, you bring him to the judgment seat. If he's broken law, then yes, I've got to do something about it. Verse 15, but, does your verse start with the word but? But, if this is a question of words and names and your own law, you're talking about worship? What law does that have to do? He's, names? You're talking about Jesus? What has that got to do with anything? And, and your own law? That, what are you talking? You're talking about your stuff. So he says, look to it yourselves. You make a judgment on that. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. That judgment of this proconsul here in Corinth helped to open doors for Paul for many more years. That one judgment. The judgment that said, this guy, he's only teaching about some man named Jesus from some Jewish law. Who cares about this from a legal standpoint? Remember what God said? I have many people in this city. I believe God was using Galileo in this situation. That through the providence of God, that Paul stood before this proconsul, uh, and, uh, and the proconsul said, let this man preach. He's not breaking any Roman laws. Verse 16, and he drove them from the judgment seat. Then, uh, then the Greeks who were there took Sosthenes, we'll see this name in a minute, took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him. They weren't allowed to beat Paul, right? Well, we're mad. We got to do something here. We can't touch this guy, so... Fine. Now, why would they take the ruler of the synagogue? Did, did these Greeks, did they recognize there to be a difference between a Jew and a Christian? In their minds, they're, they're just, they're serving the same God. And so they come and they find the ruler of the synagogue named Sothenes. They beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So verse 18 says that Paul still remained there for a good while. So Paul stays in the city of Corinth, establishes the church here uh, for a, a period of 18 months. He's there, leaves in, a, in a, about the year 52 A.D. and uh, heads, he's going to get over to Ephesus, which we'll uh, uh, talk about here in just a minute. He will come back here on his third missionary journey. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, obviously, uh, in the city of Corinth. Uh, and so we've talked about the city, we've talked about the church. Let's talk about the book. This is the book that we're studying, the letter of 1 Corinthians. Um, what, what, led, what led to this book being written? Look in chapter 19. If you're there, still in the book of Acts, um, Paul, Paul comes to the city of Ephesus uh, in, in chapter 19, 
And we learn, do I have these verses up here? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we learn from, if you put all of these verses together, and especially chapter 20 and verse 31 where Paul summarizes it. Uh, Paul spent three years. So 18 months in Corinth was almost the longest next to spending three years uh, in Ephesus. But while he is in Ephesus, uh, he gets some disturbing reports about what's happening in Corinth. Uh, look, look over in chapter, go back to 1 Corinthians now. Um, so, but I want you to put in context where Paul is. Um, Paul is now... Paul is now on his third missionary journey. When you're in Acts chapter 19, Paul is on his third uh, missionary journey. And uh, he's in the city of Ephesus for three years. And uh, he gets some reports. Look in, uh, look in chapter 1 and verse 11. Uh, who, he says, it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of, of who? Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So there's some report that has come from some member of the church in Corinth named Chloe, uh, who is expressing some concern about what's going on uh, in the city of Corinth. Uh, look in chapter 16 real quick. Hold your finger in chapter 1. We're coming back. Uh, but look over in chapter 16 um, and verse, uh, well, in verse 8, Paul says that he's going to stay there uh, in Corinth for a while or in Ephesus, I mean, uh, for a while, because uh, uh, he's, got, he's got a lot of work to do in Ephesus uh, as well. Uh, he's going to send Timothy in verse 10. Uh, he is sending Timothy to come to them to see how they're doing. Look in verse 17, uh, is the verse I wanted to get to. He says, I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, uh, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied. So here, here are the individuals that probably brought this message to Paul. Uh, they, are, they are the ones who've come to visit Paul. Perhaps they're the ones who delivered this message from Chloe. It could have been that Chloe came and reported it themselves, or it could be that Stephanus and his group uh, brought this report to Paul about what's going on. But they also brought a letter. Um, look in chapter 7. Look in chapter 7 and verse 1, where Paul says, in my Bible, I, the first word I've got in verse chapter 7, verse 1, is the word now. Uh, it's a word of transition. He's been dealing with some things, but you get to chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So the rest of this book, the rest of this book is dealing with some letter that, 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 Paul, got from, uh, that Paul got from the church in Corinth that had some questions in it. And so as you keep reading, look in chapter 8 and verse 1. Now concerning things offered up to idols. As you keep reading through these chapters, Paul's going to say, now concerning this, now concerning this, now concerning this. Why does he keep saying that? It's as if he's saying, next question, next question, next question. He's received a letter from them that's got various questions in it. And so he just starts answering uh, those questions that they have. And so what we have in what we have in in this book is, is Paul writing to a church who's dealing with a variety of situations that he's trying to correct, ones that he knows about, and then ones that he knows about, he knows about them, one, from Chloe's household, but then ones he knows about based upon their questions. Sometimes when, uh, when individuals ask questions, you, you get some insight into some things that they've been studying, insight into some concerns they have, maybe insight into what other people uh, are asking them, uh, and so that's that's where the the book of that's where the book kind of divides in half. And I'll show you just that in an outline here in just a minute. Uh, but that's where the kind of the book divides. It's not literally in half, but the first six chapters, Paul is dealing with this report that he has received from Chloe's household, and then the last ten chapters, uh, Paul is answering uh, the uh, questions that they have written. So. He writes this in about the year 55 A.D. I'm kind of weird, and just to kind of show you how, just give you insight into how I'm weird. Uh, I, up in my Bible next to where it says 1 Corinthians at the very top of the very, you know, where it says the title of the book. I've just written up there, written in about 55 A.D. Just, it, it puts a marker in my head uh, as, as to when Paul wrote it. Uh, and he wrote it about the time of Acts chapter 19. And so back in Acts chapter 19, next to verse 11, 
uh, in, next, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11 uh, is where it says that uh, Paul was there uh, for a, a period of, of years. Um, Paul worked unusual miracles. Where am I? Uh, nope, verse 10, sorry. Acts chapter 19, verse 10, where it says he continued uh, in, in Ephesus for two years. Back over there, I've got written in my margin that this is about when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. That helps me as I'm reading through the book of Acts that uh, when I see the history being recorded in the book of Acts, here's Acts 19 and verse 10 where, oh, this is about the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And so over in 1 Corinthians, I've got Acts chapter 19, verse 10, and then written about AD 55. That's just me. You don't have to do that. It just helps me to kind of put all of that together. So real quick, this is kind of overlap to what I just mentioned. Um, but here's, here's what we're looking at. Why does Paul write this book? He's writing this book because there's a church who's dealing with a lot of issues. Um, did congregations in the first century, did they have it all together? Any problems? When, uh, when Jesus tells John in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when Jesus tells John to write these letters to the seven churches of Asia, did they have any problems or were they, I mean, it, by this point, I mean, these, these congregations have been in existence for a long time. They, they had it all figured out, right? And so when, when these letters are written from Jesus to these seven churches of Asia, Jesus is just praising them for getting everything right, right? There's only one congregation of those seven, only one, that did not have any condemnation written to them. The other six, here are some things that I have against you. Can you imagine Jesus saying, here's some things I have against you? Ooh, would that shudder you? Okay, I need to pay attention to this. So congregations, now come on, these congregations were fairly new. They were the city, the church in Corinth, that's established by Paul, the apostle. They should have it all together, right? Why don't they have it all together? Why haven't they figured everything out? What? Okay, Corinth is a tough city. There's a lot of sin in the city. Why, what else? Why, why don't they have it? Why, why isn't it just smooth sailing? Okay, they don't have the Bible yet. So once the church gets the completed Bible, there's no more problems in the church, right? Man, y'all are not helping me out here. So here's this church established by the Apostle Paul. He's preaching. He's doing miracles. Why don't they have it all together? Get, what's the church made up of? Oh, People. You know, the church wouldn't have any problems if it didn't have any people in it. True statement. Church wouldn't have any problems if it didn't have any people in it. Would the church exist without people? Oh, right. Because the church is the people. This little thing, here's the, here's, can I tell you, I don't know if my fingers will do this anymore. Here's, anyway, you know the deal, right? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. What, open the door and see all the people. That's, that's kind of cute and neat, but I can't, my fingers won't even do it anymore. But this isn't the church. This is the church, right? And I, and I know it's a neat thing to say, and I'm not telling you don't teach your kids. We probably taught our kids that. I'm not telling you don't teach your kids, but this is the church. Open it up and see all the people. That's the church. Why are there issues that have to be addressed with the book of 1 Corinthians? Because... There's people. Now, when you read 1 Corinthians, let me just, uh, and, and I'm, not, I'm not expecting you to write these down. Did they have any problems in the church at Corinth? Let me just give you one or two. Um, just a few. Just a few problems uh, that they've got in the city of Corinth. Um, and, and not in the city, but in the church of Corinth. Just a few problems. Which of these does Paul address? Well, these are coming from the book of 1 Corinthians. They're, they're all there. He's dealing with... So, on one hand, does that maybe make you feel better? That if a church today is having some problems, is that church in good company? Uh, now, does that say, hey, good, we got problems, wonderful. We look like the church in Corinth. No, it's not that we're wonderful and it's great. That, but what does it tell us? That the church is made up of imperfect people who have been saved by a perfect Savior who has made us perfect 
in the eyes of God. And he is helping us through his word to continue to be made perfect. So how do you deal with all of these problems? How do you deal with how, what is the solution to all of the problems in the city of Corinth? All right, get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're not going to make it through verse 17. I'm just going to tell you that right now. We're going to make it through verse 9, all right? That's our goal this morning now. We have reduced our goal from verse 17 to verse 9, but that's okay. How do you deal with all problems? What's the answer to all problems in the church? Look in verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of who? All right, you're starting to get the answer here, right? Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of, through his own will? He's an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Who is with Paul when he writes this? Sosthenes. Wait a minute, we already read this guy's name before, right? What did we read about Sosthenes? He was the ruler of the synagogue who was plan B. They couldn't beat Paul, so they got Sosthenes instead. Is this the same Sosthenes? Well, we can't say for, sure, for certain that it is, uh, but how many other Sosthenes do you know? I know, I know, you don't know any others. We're not saying for sure it's the same guy, but let me ask you a question. Do you think that Sosthenes being beaten may have given Paul an open door to teach him the gospel? Had Paul ever been beaten? Ever suffered? Hey, Sosthenes, come over here. Let me tell you what's the real deal here. All right, verse 2 is where I want us to get. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the church of Paul, right? He's writing to the church of, does it say, I'm writing to the church of Corinth? Is that what it says? The church of God, which is at Corinth. It's not the church of Corinth. There were a lot of those. Those weren't turning out so well. He's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Who is he writing to? Those who are sanctified. What does that word mean? To be set apart. To be separated out. They have been set apart in where? Sanctified in Christ Jesus. They have been called to be saints. Saints is the noun form of the verb sanctified. They've been set apart in Christ Jesus to be what? To be set apart in Christ Jesus. They are saints. And he's writing to these individuals in Corinth, these Christians in Corinth. By the way, saints are living Christians. Um, well, they're all Christians, I guess, living or dead. But they, it's not dead individuals who are voted to be something. As soon as you become a Christian, you're a saint. So I know, I know, I know. You say, what am I? I'm not a saint. And, well, if you're a Christian, you are. Uh, now, just because you're a Christian who makes mistakes doesn't mean that you're not a saint. Um, all right. Writing to them, with all who in every place, meaning all of the rest of the church, all of the rest of the Christians in every place, who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our who? Our Lord. If you want the solution to every problem in the church, it is realization that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you want a theme for this whole book, that's it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Did they have problems in this city? Yeah. How are you going to fix those problems? Jesus Christ is Lord. Not Paul, not Sosthenes, not Gaius, not anybody else in the church at Corinth. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so you've got on the screen, here's the word Lord, going to be found six times in these first ten verses. Why is it there? So we, we just run right across the word Lord. Yeah, of course, of course the word Lord's in the Bible. You know, what, what else? What, yeah, Paul's dealing with some issues in the church, and what is he trying to fortify them in from the get-go? Jesus Christ is Lord. Ten times in the first ten verses, you read the name Christ. What does he want them to be reminded of? You, I, I'm going to come down on you pretty hard. And are, are there some? Does he come down on them pretty hard in this book? Are, are there some pretty direct statements? I do not praise you in this, as he's going to say when you get over to chapter 11. He, there's some pretty tough stuff in here. Where does he start? This is Jesus Christ. That's all that matters here. You get over to chapter 14, he says, The things I'm writing to you are the commandments of the Lord. 
And so in verse 3, in verse 3, he says, here's, here's the deal. Grace to you, and we run over this too, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when, you, when you give a gift, when you give, a, when you give a, a Christmas present, you put a tag on it that says from and to, like from and to, you do that, that's what verse 3 is. From God and Jesus Christ to you. What's in the package? What's in the gift? Two things in verse 3. What's inside? Grace and peace. Don't run, I know that's a common greeting, but don't run over it. So verse 4, I thank God always concerning you. Does that help when somebody says that to you? Does that encourage you? Paul's, Paul's going to get on them, but the first thing he wants them to know is, I thank God always concerning you. For the grace of God which was given to you, where did it come from? Y'all got to stay with me. Given to you by Christ Jesus, or maybe your Bible says in Christ Jesus. You can't have grace if you are not in Christ. Okay? It doesn't exist. And he says in verse 5 that you were enriched in everything. You were enriched in everything. In every possible avenue of being a Christian, you were enriched. By who? Who made them rich? What does it say? By Christ. By Him. You've got everything you need in all utterance so that you can talk, in all knowledge so that you can think. They were enriched in knowledge and in speech through Christ. Do the Corinthians pride themselves on their wisdom? Yep, he's going to get to that in the next several verses in the, next, in the first few chapters. They pride themselves on their wisdom. And where does Paul say that true wisdom came from? Not from their God's lowercase g, not from their, uh, their, their schoolings. It came from Christ. Even in verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ his testimony was confirmed in you through the miracles so that you come short in no gift. You're not lacking in anything. So what are they doing? Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end. He's going to take care of you. You're, they're waiting for the second coming, and Paul says that he's going to sustain you to be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to help you to be ready. So what do we see in verse 9? God is faithful. Underscore that. He's going to deal with a lot of issues in this book, but he wants them to know your God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Who is his son? Last four words of the verse. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Over and over, he wants them to understand that the foundation for answering every issue that they've got is that Christ is Lord. And they are in fellowship with Christ, and they're in fellowship with each other inside of the church. Last thing I want to say about the church at Corinth. They were the church in Corinth. That's true. What's the deal with what he's writing to them about? The problem was that Corinth was in the church. You see a difference? They were the church in this city. They were to be letting their light shine in this city. They were to be permeating, making a difference in this city. But what was happening instead? The vile nature, everything we talked about of the city, the people, was in the church. We've got to be in the world, but not of the world. And there's a difference. Thank you all. I know we rushed through some of that. We'll pick up in verse 10 next week.